it was the worst part of middle school. And if you've ever been to middle school, that's saying something. My parents made me take band for two years. No. My grandfather played the trumpet, and so guess what I got to play? The trumpet. Name one famous trumpeter other than Chris Boddy and Scott Thomas. Go. That's what I thought. <laughs> That's what I thought. For those of you who love jazz, you, you know somebody none of us know. All right, that's fine. No part of me, no part of me wanted anything to do with band. And so it was a constant battle. But I can tell you there was one day I had fun in band. And that's because we had a substitute teacher. Now, if there has ever been a class you should not have a substitute teacher for, it is band. And the vast majority of people decided it'd be fun to change instruments. Now, again, I played the trumpet. And as much as I love causing trouble, I also love not sharing my germs with people I don't know that well. And so I had my mouthpiece, and I was more than happy just to slide that. I don't even know what it's called, but there's some way to tune a trumpet. and You, you slide it in and out a little bit. To, again, I was only in for two years. I really didn't care whether or not I was playing in tune or not. Uh, I can get you through about from about C to G, and then, then we're done. Uh, but what I decided was I would just untune my... But the vast majority of the band... We had tuba players sitting in clarinet chairs, and they had clarinets they were holding. And we had trombone players playing flute. It was an incredible disaster, and it was so much fun. It was glorious. The look on the substitute teacher's face, she didn't have a clue what was going on. She, she just thought, oh, it's a middle school band, which again, if you've ever heard a middle, apologies to any of you who are in middle school band right now, but if you've ever heard a regular middle school band play, it sounds like an atrocity. So really, she didn't know how far off this was, but it was absolutely brutal. And she was up there waving her arms. She didn't know the difference between 4-4 time and 3-4 time. It was an absolute disaster, and it was so much fun to be a part of, as we just, we just were awful for a day. And that was a lot of fun. But what we saw that day is it was very clear to me. There are just some there's just some areas that you should never have a substitute teacher. Why? Because teachers should know what they're talking about. They should know what they're doing a little bit. And so when you bring in a substitute teacher who's just there to, to get the check at the end of the day and doesn't have any music background, she has no idea what's going on. And yet when we look at the world around us right now, what we see is we see a lot of people who have no idea what's going on. And that's somewhat dangerous. But where it gets especially dangerous is where the people who have no idea of what's really going on then decide that they need to be the voice that yells the loudest and they need to be the expert and they need to be the person that teaches everybody else and everybody else listens to. Last week we saw, as, as we just started something called Enhanced, and it's a three-week look at the book of Titus. Last week we saw that all of us have a choice to make. We're in a route. And we have to make a choice of what our lives are going to look like. And that choice is ours. But if we decide that we're going to pursue Jesus, then our lives need to look a certain way that indicates that we've made the choice to follow Jesus. And yet, if we make the choice that we're not going to pursue Jesus, then our lives are going to look a very different way than when our lives look as we have pursued Jesus. Jesus. And yet, as we look at our culture, oftentimes the people who want to yell the loudest and tell everybody else to model their lives after them and to look at me are the people who've got it wrong. And so that is the foundation, and we're going to continue looking at the book of Titus today. You can follow along in your Bible apps or on your phones or your tablets. Otherwise, you can follow along on the screens as we pick up in Titus 2, verse 1, where we read this. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. What he's saying is, Titus, in your life, make sure you teach what's true. Make sure you are a voice of truth. Make sure that you have it all together and make sure then that you go out and you proclaim that which is true. And now we're going to see some practical steps in this. Older men, are to be sober-minded, they're to be dignified, they're to be self-controlled, sound in faith, 
in love and in steadfastness. Older men, you be sober-minded. Be sober-minded. Carry yourself in a dignified manner. Be a person that is full of self-control. That you are sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Basically what he's saying is make sure, gentlemen, as you mature, as you get older, make sure that you are an individual who is grounded and consistent. Make sure that your life is one that when people look at you, and we saw last week what everybody should aspire to be, and that list is available online if if you missed last week, but we saw the list that everybody's supposed to aspire to be. And as you get older, as you've matured, as you've worked through this process, as you've made the decision to follow Jesus, and now you've become more like Jesus, make sure your life is one that is defined with consistency and make sure that you are a grounded individual. This is the test. This is the test. That as you grow, as you mature, gentlemen, make sure that you set the standard and that you are an individual who is grounded and there is a level of consistency about you. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. Older women, likewise, make sure that your behavior is reverent, that you're not out gossiping and slandering other people, and that you're, not, that you're not a drunkard, that you're not a slave to too much wine. Watch how you act. Don't slander people or get drunk. What's it all boil down to? Set a good example. Set a good example. As you grow and as you mature, you realize that some things that were really cool when you were 18, 19, 20, 21, they're, they're, not, as, they're not as cool anymore. And, and that's, that's okay. That's part of the maturing process. You grow and, and you understand this. You have a different perspective. We've all, we have all seen the guy. We've all seen the guy who's 60 going on 16. And it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. And we've all seen the lady who's 60 going on 17. And you're like, no, just stop. It's not working for you. It didn't work for you back then. It's definitely not working for you now. Watch how you act and set a good example. And this doesn't mean that as you get older and as you, as you become more mature, that you have to be a boring individual who never has any fun and, and that you have to sit at home and watch Lawrence Welk reruns every Saturday night, all right? We're not saying that this is what your life has to look like. And I know for those of you who love Lawrence Welk, I'll get the email tomorrow. That's fine. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll have a lovely time in Branson in a couple weeks, and it'll be, that'll be great, and it'll be a fun time. And that's, I, I don't begrudge you, okay? But I'm not sitting down and watching Polka for an hour and a half. That's just not me. Just not me. And that's okay if that's your thing. We can have different things. But it it doesn't mean that everybody's life has to look like this. But what it does mean is that our lives should be pictures of consistency, that we should be grounded. It does mean that we've left behind the, the slandering of other people, the gossiping, that we're not getting drunk anymore, and that when you look at our lives, we are a picture and a good example to other people. That's the call. That's what people who make the decision to follow Jesus, that's what our lives have to look like. And what's the result of this? And so, train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. So what we have here is this beautiful pattern that needs to exist. We have just a beautiful glimpse of what the church should be. It should be people who have grown and they have matured and they have learned from their mistake and they have picked up life lessons and they are closer to Jesus today than they were 10 years ago. And a result of that is they then reproduce the lessons and the stories that they have of their own lives, that they share the secrets of their success, and they share from their failures with people who come behind them. That there is a pattern of the older teaching the younger. That everybody is looking for somebody to be invested in. The church needs this to happen. 
that you at all times have somebody that you're pouring into and you're mentoring. That you're honest about the lessons you've learned, about your own faults, about your own failings, about your successes, and you help people who come behind you and you help replicate that. At all times, we need to have people in our lives that we are pouring into and we need to have people in our lives that we are being poured in. At all times. We aren't called to go through life alone. God never designed it that way. And this is part of community. That we would come alongside one another and we would celebrate each other and we would push one another more and more to be like Jesus. That is what we are all about here at Lakeside. Our vision is this. We want to help people move one step closer to Jesus and reach people who are far from him. And one of the greatest tools we have in achieving that vision is you and your life and you pouring into other people. And so if you have all of this wisdom and you aren't sharing it with anybody, you're missing it. You're missing it. Now, at the same time, don't be the person who's like, I got all this wisdom. I'm going to share it with everyone, regardless of whether or not they've asked for it. And on the flip side, if you're, if you're looking for wisdom in your life, don't approach somebody and just say, hey, mentor me, because that puts the onus on them. And oftentimes, the people that you want to mentor you are really successful, and they have it all together, but that means that they're incredibly busy, and it's not that they don't care about you or love you or want you to, to succeed. It just means that they can't do for everybody what you're asking them to do. So instead of just approaching somebody and saying, hey, mentor me, try this approach. Reach out to somebody you admire, who you vetted, who has it all together, and say, I was wondering if I could have a half hour to an hour of your time. And if I, could, if I could talk to you about these three things. And most people, the vast majority of people, if you approach them that way and you say, hey, here's what I'd like to talk about, it shows them that you have a plan, it shows them that you're serious about this, and it shows them that you want to learn. Most people are going to find the time. Now, it might not be for six months, but most people are going to find the time for you to sit down with you and talk to you about the things that you want to talk about. And when they do, when they do, eat it up. But don't leave that meeting and change nothing. Listen to their advice. And it doesn't mean that you have to accept it all, but if there's pushback, then ask them for another meeting and, and gently push back a little bit and say, hey, could you clarify this or help me understand this? Or do you think that would work in this situation? And provide them more context, but have a plan. And if somebody asks you, hey, would you be available to meet with me and talk with me about these things? Then do your best to make a spot available in your calendar to meet with that person and pour into them. And you'll see if it's a good fit. And if it's a terrible fit, it's not something that you have to continually do in Jesus' name. But if it's a great fit, then continue to explore that. This is what is, is God's design for the church. That we would help one another and we would pour into one another's lives. And it starts here. And this is the pattern that the older would take the lessons that they've learned, they would take the mistakes that they have, and they would pour into the younger generation, and they would help them on their way. So very simply, I want to ask you this. Who are you investing in? And who's investing in you? Who are you investing in? And who's investing in you? We here at Lakeside, we see the need for this. We see the importance for it. And so if there's any way that we can help you facilitate these relationships, if there's any way that we can help you facilitate this mentoring aspect, then please reach out to us and let us know. And we'll do anything we can to help facilitate that. If you need a place to meet, if, if you need to be pointed in a direction, let us know and we will do our best to help facilitate that. But I also just want to say that one of the things, and, and just highlight, one of our passions here at Lakeside is that this is going to be modeled in every aspect of our ministry. In every aspect of our ministry. 
This is going to be modeled. And so we unapologetically have just reinvigorated and, and we've just refocused on, on our kids' ministry within, within the last year, without apology. Because we see this pattern, and oh, by the way, we're going to see the importance of starting when they're young. And so without apology, I want you to know that we believe that what happens down that hallway with the Lakeside Littles and the Lakeside Kids is just as vital as what happens in here. And we, we've just put a huge commitment towards that. And that will be true for as long as Lakeside is here, that we are not just about this generation or that generation, but we are about the generations to come. And we don't see kids as the church of tomorrow. They're just as much a part of the church of today. And so without apology, you just have to understand that is something that we are incredibly, incredibly passionate about. And we're going to show you why in here in a minute. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. So that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. Listen, you need to shine. You need to shine so that when you're attacked, your critics don't have anything of substance to offer. You're going to be attacked. You're going to face criticism. Listen to me, especially for those of you in, in, in middle school and high school and in college right now, not everyone is going to love you. And you have to understand that's okay. Not everyone is going to love you. And you've got it so hard right now. You have it harder than, I, I believe, than any generation that has come before you. With the explosion of, of social media, it, it's just, it's a disaster right now. And I'm not saying don't be on social media, but I'm just saying just be so careful. Be so careful because what it does is it invites criticism for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It highlights everything. And so when I went to middle school, or when I went to high school, if somebody tri tripped in the cafeteria and they spilled their food all over the floor, it was still funny. It was, it was, it was funny. And you're like, whew, thank, thankfully I wasn't that guy. I mean, you're going through puberty. You don't have full control of your body. It's, it's, you're awkward. It's an awkward, it's an awkward stage. We've all been there, got it. And you're just like, whew, dodged a bullet that today it wasn't me that fell. But nowadays you trip in the cafeteria. Somebody's already recorded it and it's on Snapchat and then it's on, it's on Instagram, on the story feature. But then somebody screen caps that, and then they post it to YouTube, where it lives forever. And then you get to relive falling in the cafeteria 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And all of a sudden, your mistakes are magnified. You, I, I mean... What, what people used to do to propose to somebody, to spend the rest of their lives with them, you, you've, got these poor, you've got these poor schlups doing every time they ask a girl to prom. Listen, guys, you want to ask a girl to prom, go get her a flower. If you're, fe if you're feeling good, go get her a bouquet. Go to her house. Ring the doorbell. Say, hey, I like talking to you. I think you're cute. I think we'd have a lot of fun if you went to prom with me. Will you go to prom with me? Hand her the flowers, get her answer, you leave. You don't put on a fireworks show, all right? You don't get a tattoo, because you're going to break up six weeks later anyhow. This, listen, this is just Uncle Brian talking, all right? Start small and have somewhere to go. Because if you're doing all this, if, you, if it costs you $1,000 to ask a girl to go to prom, good luck going from there, buddy. All right? Good luck. How are you going to ask her to marry you? You're going to rent a private jet and fly her to Paris, and, and then good luck with the hunt. See, there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go. And all of this, it's a competition now. It's got to be on social. No, forget all that. You get her a flower. If you're feeling generous, a bouquet. You walk up to the house. You say, will you go to prom? If she says no, it's her loss. Ladies, if a guy, if a guy asks you to go to prom and you don't want to go to prom with him, tell him no. Don't go to prom with him. All right? But, but forget all of this nonsense. And then, oh my, if a relationship ends, it's all over social media. Listen to me. 
never, ever, ever respond on social media when a relationship ends. It may feel good in a moment. It will never end well. Listen, not everyone's going to love you. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to face criticism in this world, especially in this world. And there's now video of every mistake that everyone makes. So do your best to live a life that shines. And you don't give people a single inch. Then when your critics come to attack you, and they will, that they've got nothing of substance to offer. And that they are seen as petty and ridiculous. Don't give in to the game. You make sure that you shine in your life. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. That your life models good works. And in your teaching, when you do teach, you show integrity. That you are a person that people can actually look at and feel confident. Not that you're perfect, because none of us are. But that when people look at your life, they feel good about it. And they see that you're not a hypocrite, but you really do practice what you preach. That you are a person who is dignified. And that you watch your words. And you watch what you say. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters and everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. When you get a job, listen to your boss. When you get a job, listen to your boss. Don't argue. Don't steal. And if you do that, you will be a model employee. When you get a job, don't argue with your boss. Listen to your boss. Do what they ask you to do. Don't argue with them and with all of your coworkers. Stay above the fray. Don't get caught up in the office drama. Let everybody else be catty. You be kind to all. And don't steal. And if you do those three things, you will set yourself out in the workforce. It sounds ridiculous. It sounds like, well, that's just common sense. And it is, but unfortunately, it isn't. Why is this important? Not just because you'll be a model employee, but because, remember, you choose Jesus. And this is so countercultural that people will see Jesus in you listening to your boss. They will see Jesus in you staying above the fray and being kind to all your coworkers. And they will see Jesus in you not stealing. Now, some of you might find yourself in a horrible work environment. And in years past, where maybe you felt like you had to stay with that, the, the economy right now is in such a state that there's really no excuse or really no reason for you to stay stuck. And I understand that there are some specialized areas, and this isn't true across the board, but for the vast majority of you, if you feel like you're going to a job you hate, you just need to find a different job. And if you're being asked to do things that go against your beliefs, quit your job and find a place where you can go and that doesn't ask you to compromise on the things that you believe and those places are out there and when you find those places listen to your boss be kind to everybody and don't steal and you'll set yourself above board why so you can point them to jesus For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Why does all this matter? Because of the work of God. That grace is available to us because we all fall short. None of us measure up. God's standard is perfection. None of us meet it. And so God has given us grace. He's paid the price that none of us could pay in his son, Jesus, dying on the cross, raising again three days later. But we have to, de- we have to die to our desires 
and that which comes naturally to us so often in order for us to be godly. That we need to become enamored with Jesus and our focus day in and day out is to become more and more and more like Him. That we declare these things as we've made that decision to become more like Jesus. That we exhort and we rebuke with all authority. And we let no one disregard us. That we would live passionately. That we would live passionate lives because we have nothing to hide and we have nothing to fear. That we would forget the haters that hold down so many. We just say forget the haters. When you attack me, I'm going to live my life in such a way that your attacks come off as petty. Because people are going to see, they're not going to see me, but they're going to see Jesus through me and the way I conduct my life. That has to be our focus. But understand, there will be haters. And here's the deal. The earlier we start this foundation, the better. The earlier we start the foundation, the better. That's why the older need to be invested in the younger. Because the, the earlier we can start building these ideas and pointing people to Jesus, the more time we have to become like Jesus and the greater impact we will have. We love kids here for this very reason. So we've just, in the past four months, completely renovated all of our kids' spaces. And I went down and I was looking one day in the room, and I saw this. And it's a chair. It's a plastic chair, and it's fine. But you know, in our culture, in our society, a lot of times, what we hear is, it's kids. It's fine. And I want you to know at Lakeside, we're going to change the inflection. It's not going to be, it's kids, it's fine. Because what that conveys is, it doesn't really matter. It's all right. This week, I, I started coaching Little League Baseball. And there was a scheduling conflict. And so for the first practice of our season, I watched as 24 little boys who were playing Little League, some for the first time, who, who are six to eight years old, I watched as they had to have their first practice out behind, if they didn't get to practice on a field, they got to practice in some grass behind a field. Why? It's kids. It's fine. No. We're going to change the inflection. And at Lakeside, it's going to be it's fine. They're kids. It's fine. They're kids. I don't want to sit in this. And so we made a purchase. And we got 40 of these. And then I went and I looked at their Bibles. And there was some writing in some of them. And there were some pages that were ripped. Because that's what happens when you give kids books. But we got them new Bibles. And we got them new chairs. Because they're kids. And we've got to start the foundation. When they're young. And we took money out of the bank for all this. 
So what I'm asking you today to do is to make a statement. Over and above what you'd normally give, if you can, for the cost of a dinner out, for 40 bucks. And I know for some people that's cost prohibitive and that's fine. But if you can, for the cost of one dinner out, for 40 bucks, we can make a statement today through a chair and through two new Bibles for the Lakeside Littles and the Lakeside Kids Room that just say, we believe the kids matter here at Lakeside. And I want you to know I'm not doing something, or I'm not asking you to do something I'm not willing to do. So the first five are on me. And I'm asking if 35 more of you, at one time, Give 40 bucks over what you normally would give. Just so we as a church would stand up and say, we believe the younger matter. We believe that we are going to set the foundation. Kids matter. And it's not about the money because, again, we took the money out of the bank. It's about the statement. And this is a chance for us to put our money where our mouth is. God help us. God help us set a foundation. God, I pray that we would be a place that models older people coming alongside and setting an example for the younger. I pray, God, that we would set that foundation. God, that there would be no question. So, Lord, I pray that our lives would would just look more and more like you. And that all of us would have people who are pouring into us, and we would all have people that we are pouring into. Help us change the inflection. Help us move people closer to you. And start that foundation while they're young. In your son, Jesus' name we pray.